Good Hello. morning. We should talk about her. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Um, okay, so what was Doctor Smith miming? Um, yeah. What What is that? <laughs> Any ideas? <laughs> no ideas. They don't know. Wow. They don't know. They shouldn't know. You are... They might have watched movies. So old. No. Okay, so... Can you hear us? Yeah. <laughs> Is this on? <laughs> um, okay. Maybe not. Maybe not. Um, is it recording, though? Yes, it is recording. Because this is the good stuff. This is the good stuff. So They're just speaking amongst themselves. Dr. Smith <laughs> is so old... How old is he? ...that when phones were in his house, they were the original ones that were... But no, they weren't, the, they weren't these ones. They were these ones, the rotary phones. <laughs> And we had a party line. My ring. There we and go. we shared it with Bob Byers down the road, which is really good because he was an 80-year-old. Wait, wait, wait. Ah. That's too fast. A party line. Do you know what a party line I'm is? I'm going to explain it. Oh, okay. But like, so a party slowly. line means that we had a specific ring that multiple people had the same phone line and that you shared it with them. And so you had a specific ring. Ours was one long and two short. And that meant the phone call was for us. And if you were nosy... You picked up the phone quietly and you listened to other people's calls. Yeah. So Because that was like the internet. <laughs> I'm sure party lines still exist and I'm sure that people still use them. And they, I are, know that they are way less frequent um, in the world right now. And so I find it an amazing bit of technology. I also had a rotary phone when I was a kid, but not for very long. Yeah, because you are like... Young. Well, and from a rural community, and you're also from a rural oh, community. I'm from near a rural near community. <laughs> <laughs> Way more rural than us, than me. But, yes. Um, okay. And I remember the first cell phone, because my dad was a, a union leader and kind of a union shit disturber. And so he uh, was in the process of leading a strike, and they got him a cell phone. This was like the only thing that I remember when you I was like, on like a backpack? six years old. Yeah. And yeah, literally it had, <laughs> it had a carrying case and it was this big and it had a, 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 a receiver with like a, a wire to this huge battery pack. It was amazing. This okay. is good. There's got, there's rotary phones in basements. There um, we go. The party line also known as the gossip source. Nice. Uh, my grandparents had a party line. Good. They still exist in some rural U.S. Remember car phones. Remember, yeah, yeah. dial-up internet as a kid. Totally. Yeah, well yeah, done. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Thank you, Carly, for singing a song about phone calls. Yeah. <laughs> I'll phone you like a psychopath. Mm. It's like, just text me, Carly. Come on. <laughs> um, wonderful. How are we feeling? Seven is, is a popular one. Um, five, I think, is always popular, but seven is particularly... Yeah, a, a kind of stand a, out. We have a four five seven. A four five seven. Ah, uh, bigger what you got right there, dear. Beep, you beep, got a beep, four five beep, seven. Beep, 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 four five seven. Okay. Um. Yeah. I I don't know what I'm feeling. What are you feeling? What number are you? I think I'm an eight. Today. I aspire to a nine. <laughs> Wee! I feel like I might be a four. Okay. Good. You might be a four. <laughs> Wonderful. I am whatever is in the most amount of pain. Yeah. Okay, super. So let us uh, clear this and uh, move away from here and on to the stuff. Um, just a, an acknowledgement. <laughs> Sh shut up, Jacobs. But let me just say um, the uh, topic test uh, was done very well. Um, some of you were are disappointed. Some of you are um, unsure about what went on, and oh my goodness, and you're doing all the right things. I've been hearing from you. It's totally fine. Um, what I will say is we don't we don't do read grades. We correct mistakes, and so if we have made an error, and we make errors, there's a lot of us marking behind the scenes. Errors will happen. Um, what you need to do is put together uh, an email for Dr. Ward Campbell um, with, you know, the details. Uh, let us know what course you're in. <laughs> That's helpful. If you're writing to me anyway, I teach so many courses, I usually write back and go, oh my goodness, just tell me what course you're in and I'll help you. Um, okay, so, so tell us the section, tell us, you know, the question that you're talking about. 
tell us what the feedback was, tell us where we made the mistake. Like if, for example, we didn't mark it, like that would be a mistake and oh my goodness, we'll totally fix that. <laughs> um, you know, that kind of deal. Um, just let us know what the mistake is and uh, we will fix it. Um, and what else that you want to say about it? The average was great. Um, I don't remember exactly what it was, but it was totally decent. We took a look at every question afterwards to see if there was one that we like totally dropped the ball on writing. I didn't see any evidence of that. So I think, I think it was the good. thing to it's a, I'll just reiterate yeah. a thing that you said the other day, which was that this is for some of you, it was your first mm. test in university. So well done. However you did it, you did it. Um, and the other is that uh, it is a good model now. You understand, you've seen it, and we're not going to be like changing it out. There's not going to be a <laughs> radical change where it's like, and now memorize. It's like, <laughs> no, no. Now you're gonna be. We're gonna be asking the same kind of questions, scenarios, yeah. synthesis, where you integrate uh, the things that we've been talking about. And we'll do, I don't know if, uh, if, if you want, we're going to, we'll, but we're hoping if you want to, we'll do that asynchronous study tool. Um, I uh, and Dr. Smith, we jumped onto it a few times and we were like, ah, oh, these guys are amazing. It was looking really good. Um, but one of the, one of the things maybe if you're trying to figure out like, what could I do differently next time? Or I need to kind of change my game. Uh, did you go on to the asynchronous study tool, for example? And that might be a helpful thing to try next time. Um, and did you participate? Did you like contribute or did you just read what everyone was writing? So there are, there are tools and then there are more effective ways of using them. Um, and, uh, sometimes we tend to just think, well, if I access all the tools, then I've done everything I need to do. And, and if you were a cabinet maker, you yeah. would never make better cabinets by going in and looking and counting your tools. Yes. You do it by Ooh. making crappy cabinets and then you make better cabinets yeah. and then you make oh, yeah. cabinets. Yeah. And if this is just an elective course and all you need to do is pass, then just keep on doing what you're doing. And of it's course, fine. if you're a cabinet maker in the Ottawa Valley, you tend to move away because there's a cabinet maker. There's like dairy farm, beef farm, cabinet maker, dairy farm, beef farm, forester, cabinet maker. Yeah. So you got to go somewhere else to make your cabinets. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, people still coming in. Come on in. Welcome. Uh, oh, you know what? We what? could move ahead to the next one while oh, okay. we finish talking about it. Oh, talking about the yeah this takes a little bit okay because dr smith has a question for you yeah so your dairy bush um i think as many of you know has lots and lots of photographs being taken in there photographs and videos um these are four different videos of some fox kits this one and what i would like to know from you is I'm going to enter one of these in a in a contest so that I can talk more widely about the dairy bush and about um, <laughs> that wildlife and urban wildlife and so there is like top left there's nursing uh, top right is uh, kind of morning sunshine what the the bottom left is a slow burn but it's <laughs> it's it's a clown car <laughs> There's going to be close to 15 foxes that come out of that hole. And then in the bottom right, they're all watching in synchrony crows above them. Oh, and mom's there. And I can only enter one. And you can only enter one? Yep. Oh, goodness. Okay, so which one should Dr. Smith enter? Oh, yeah. Look at that. Yeah, I really like it because it's, it's well-framed, right? It, yes. It It is. They are uh, all identical, but it's yes, greener. She, she has sat on the... They are cute. Yeah. She is on the left-hand side. Uh, they, uh, yeah, I, I'm going to go. I'm going to say, yeah, I agree. I, even though I really like the clown car one. <laughs> um, yeah. Thank you, everyone. I, uh, that is awesome. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much. So hopefully we you, will be celebrating a win. Yeah, and if you can look around uh, later on. Oh, leave it for a second as she leaves because she's right in the sun as she nurses there. It's just kind of like. Oh, that's beautiful. Gorgeous. Yeah. If you want to see more of these, um, they're on my YouTube channel. There's a playlist of all the dairy bush fox dens. There's a couple of dens that I have cameras on, and they capture different things. Uh, when everyone was away in the first uh, tremendous lockdown, we had more coyotes on yeah. campus. Uh, so there's some gorgeous coyotes as well as uh, deer, foxes, uh, mice, squirrels, 
all sorts, it's a bunch of species of birds, but it's a it's a fun way to examine the place you share with okay. a lot of other animals. And asking again for your continued and awesome patience, I have another question for you. <laughs> If any of you, while taking any quizzes associated mm. with this course, yeah. have seen any evidence of respondus interfering, like, for example, you do one of our little weekly quizzes, and then it says, you do it, you submit it, and then it says, shut down, lock down respondus, or something like that, please get in touch. Please let me know because um, that just freaks me out and apparently it can happen. So if Respondus is interfering with any of your courses that do not use Respondus, I would love an email from you uh, so that we can figure out what's going on. It's a tech problem. We but... need to gather some evidence as to where yeah. that's happening because it is not happening from our end, but it means that somewhere within the desire to learn or course like world, there is something being yeah. triggered yeah. that should not be. Yeah. Okay, public service announcement made. And moving on. Oh, there we go. We're going to do some stuff today. It's going to be uh, chaotic and uh, messy, and so is biology. So, yay, it's perfect. It works out really well. We're going to play with ecosystems and we're going to see what can happen. But first, the homework. So, um, let's uh, catch everyone up if you didn't do your homework. Uh, let's wait just but like but don't you gotta annotate. don't yet don't annotate yet, but you gotta just get your annotation ready because we're gonna do this and if it's super like if you're jumping all over the places, it doesn't work. So what we want you to do is to get a red line ready. So a red line um, in your annotation tools. Test it out on the margins if you want to make sure that it's red. There we think. Wonderful. You're all ready to go. Okay. And if you're colorblind, that's fine. That's fine. And if you want to use hearts to make a line, that's fine too. Okay. So what you're going to do is using your red line, I would love for you to draw on this graph a density dependent control treatment. So a treatment that is density dependent with respect to its effectiveness based on population. Yeah. Amazing. So good. Okay. And now I would love for you to get a blue line and draw an effective density independent control treatment population density independent that is effective. So good. And now a density independent treatment that is not effective. Amazing. Okay. Yay. Well okay. done you. Put well your done. hands up. Pat yourself on the back or okay. the neck. Super good. Or the okay. Head. So let, let me correct a few things here. Okay. Um, because what I see is uh, some green and blue diagonal lines. Mm -hmm. And they should not be diagonal. They should be only horizontal. And I think what what might be the the kind of misconception is the idea is potentially that effectiveness is decreasing but we've already said that it is not effective and it doesn't decrease with population density because it's population density independent so the lines need to be horizontal because the x-axis does not influence how that ineffectiveness or effectiveness changes. Does that make sense? Leave it open for you to ask any questions in the chat. And what I'll do is that I'll, if you don't mind, I, I, I'm not super big fan of like, here are the correct answers. But like, let me just draw it for you with simple lines. So we have density dependent control treatment, right? So it's dependent upon the density. It means it's going to change as the population density changes. 
So here, as it gets more dense, the effectiveness gets uh, higher. The sort of the effectiveness of the treatment or the mechanism by which it, it transmits, okay? And if, you, if it's not too soon, you can think of this as COVID, right? If you think about it in terms of like how it spreads, as the population density increases, its R value increases because it can spread more effectively in denser populations because the mechanism by which it spreads requires close contact, okay? Um, okay, the next line is a green line. Uh, density independent that isn't very effective. So here we go. Can anybody think of a density independent treatment that is not very effective? Do you have any like ideas for what that might be? I think I have one. I'll have to ask Dr. Smith though if I'm right. Any ideas? So the one that comes to mind that, that are, like first came to my mind was citronella candles for mosquito repellent. So it's just ineffective. Ineffective and density independent, right? It creates this like big cloud and as long as like the mosquitoes are in it, then like the mosquitoes are being subjected to it, but it doesn't work very well. So like density independent, is that, does that work? It does. Cool. But it's so, in, it's so <laughs> ineffective that it's... Not a controlled treatment? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. Okay, and then one that is effective. Uh, there you go. Okay, does that, does that is that cool? So it's really key. Um, this is not easy stuff. So if you need, you know, you're like, oh, I have to revise it. Yes, you'll have to revise this. This is not easy stuff. Could the red line also be diagonal? Downwards. Down. Oh shit. So it would, the denser the population, so, so yes, I don't know if I can think of an example. Like, so the idea would be that the denser the population, the less effective it is. What, do we know of anything that is only effective at low population densities? For, there would be no reason like economically or technologically to develop this. Does it exist? I don't know. Could we draw it that way and like describe a thing? Absolutely. Um, but thank you for that. We're gonna have to think Someone's about that. Someone's suggesting antibiotic resistance. I don't think so. No. Half, and it doesn't. So half joking doesn't. I I, I can't yeah. read real quick to see it, but it's this is great. It's, no, so no, no. Figured this is a good question. This is exactly what you want to be asking yourself because if you can ask yourself that and you can work through it, then like you'll learn stuff. Um, introduction of an invasive species to control another invasive species. I think I might start to believe that. That might... It, it depends on the yep. mechanism of control. Yep. So if you're talking like schooling fish that are way more effective in denser groups at, at warding off predators, then maybe, maybe if that's what you're thinking mm. about. Oh, I have an idea. Cystic fibrosis. Oh. Hmm. Okay. Okay. You guys and your ideas. Yeah. Okay. Maybe. Maybe. We'll start inserting slides. Yeah. Be like ideas. Discuss ideas. <laughs> Wonderful. Well okay. Done. Good. So um, these Only are effective if they stay away from other cystic fibrosis. There patients. you go. Right. Like so. This is mm. yeah. Okay, I, I don't know en enough about all of these things to like dive in and go yes for sure, but I like what you're doing in terms of thinking about it, thinking about the mechanism. Yeah. Really focus on the mechanism, okay? Super. So, here is your homework question, and it's two slides, so what I'll do is I'll throw the poll at you, and then for those of you who for some reason can't access the poll, I'll switch to the other slide and then I'll switch back that kind of deal because it's like it's based on this this data. So let's call the blue line treatment B, the red line treatment A and the green line treatment C. And here's your question. Mm. Can you go to zoom for a second, the zoom view? Yeah, you can't see me sharing my question, right? Okay. Okay. 
Does anybody need to see it on the slide too? Here's the question on the slide. But I don't want to, like, I know that you want to look at the, the different colors, so let me know if you need me to go back to the question. Yes, please. Mm. Okay, how can we do this? There we go. Treatment B, A, and C. B, A, and C. screen grab for next year. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, and then I'll go back and give you the... Oh! There's the B, A, and C, and then population density and effectiveness. So I can put that on there too. Okay, sorry about that. The splitting up in Rosansky 104. We can. We we have two not, big screens that we split not, the screen. Not that it matters. Not that it matters. <laughs> okay, cool. I think uh, so. Eighty percent of you have participated, um, which is actually not bad for this time of year. This time of year is difficult, eh? Oh my goodness. Um, yeah, it's getting dark. Whew. Um, and yeah, so we often see a little kind of drop in enthusiasm. That's fine. You'll see it with us too, probably. <laughs> um, but okay, final, final few seconds uh, to go in and, and click. And let's take it up. We're, we're going to take it up because it's important and um, uh, there's not a huge consensus about what the right answer is. So shall we? Um, share results. Okay. So it's not like a whole ton of you. It's totally fine if today is just not your day. I hear you. Okay, so let's take a look, okay? Treatment B is not transmitted by coughing. So we're looking for the statement that is not consistent, right? Treatment B is not transmitted by coughing. Treatment B is density independent, so it's not transmitted by coughing. Coughing is close contact, usually very much related to population density. So uh, that uh, is a statement that is consistent. Treatment A's effectiveness will be really low in rural places. Um, yeah, I think so. Population density is a lot less in rural places and therefore the effectiveness will be low in those places. So that's consistent with a density dependent control or zombie apocalypse. Uh, treatment A is the best option to eradicate the population. Cool. So the answer is A is C. Treatment A is not the best option to eradicate a population. So let's figure out why. What's the statement or what can we say to explain why a density dependent treatment factor is not a good idea if you want to eradicate the population? What's, what's, the, what's the convincing argument?
It won't work when there are a few individuals left. Super good. Yeah, exactly. So it's really good, potentially, at thinning a population, right? Reducing a population. But once the density starts to be affected, so does the effectiveness. And so the effectiveness of the treatment drops off, okay? And what you end up with is a less effective treatment. Remember, there, it, this line does go into this space, into this area. So as the population density decreases because of the effectiveness of the treatment with population density, <laughs> then it starts to become less effective, okay? Which means that when you get down to low population size or low population density, you're not gonna be able to get rid of them uh, because it um, uh, because it's no longer effective and for some reason my slides are just kind of randomly shifting through okay good you should stop trying treatment C because it ain't working it is definitely not working it is not very effective so don't spend your money on um, uh, citronella candles uh, and then finally, the last one, treatment A represents a deadly fungus that is spread when two individuals touch. Treatment A, sure, that's a close contact density dependent Sometimes mechanism. Okay. Touch. So I hope that was helpful. This stuff isn't easy. You know what we need? What? Penguin. We need a penguin? Yep. I think we need penguins. So let us take you to a magical place Shh. on the planet. Magical for like all the reasons. Now, one of the reasons it's magical is because there's a book that was written about this place. <laughs> who wrote that book? I don't know. We should ask the Pope. Now, who <laughs> in whose library does this book sit? I, I wrote this book. For some reason, it ended up in the Pope's library because it was given to the Pope by the Minister of heritage of Argentina. It's a massively weird story. And the only way that I found out about it was literally on Facebook. There's a photo of the Pope holding my book. It was, yeah, it was super weird. I mean, to be honest, he's being handed your book. Yes. Because the current Pope is Argentine. And so it was a thing. Anyway. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So you are in the Vatican Library. <laughs> I'm in the Vatican so the next library. time, so literally, as the statement goes, when in Rome, <laughs> read my book. Take your card, <laughs> take your library card to the Vatican, and be like, "I'd like to okay. see Jacobs, uh, 2010, please." Oh my goodness! Yeah. Okay. So Antarctica, near and dear to my heart, it is the ant of anti of everything. It is the anti of the Arctic. The Arctic is an no bears. <laughs> there are no bears. <laughs> the Arctic is an ocean surrounded by land. Antarctica is land surrounded by an ocean. The Arctic is full of an incredibly rich uh, culture. People all the way around, circumpolar people, indigenous people, all of the people, all of the culture, all of the fantastic interconnections between people and land. There is no, as of yet, no identified culture, human culture associated with Antarctica. So um, it is uh, just, yeah, an incredibly bizarre and wonderful place. And so we want to bring you there. Um, and I think for many of us, uh, the connection that we have to Antarctica is through a little movie about a penguin. And I love this little penguin. So they don't sing, but yeah. <laughs> okay. So if Happy Feet is still like within your sort of cultural library, um, uh, yay. If not, don't worry about it. I'm sure we've all heard of this magical place. No bears, only penguins, uh, and a few other things, but just very, very simple, no bears. Okay. So what we want you to do, if you don't mind, uh, is uh, either on the slide or in the chat, think about all of the elements of an Antarctic ecosystem. Okay, so remember, we're talking about biotic and abiotic. What are the things in an Antarctic ecosystem that come to mind? And you can think about it in terms of the Happy Feet characters, because unless you say puffins, don't say puffins, uh, you'll be right. Happy Feet. Happy Feet's still a thing. Okay, good. Commercial fishing. Oh, Nancy. Thank you. Yes. 
What else? What other elements can you think about? Pebbles, ice, cold, other, other penguin, penguin species. species. Precipitation is low. Yep, it is a desert, believe it or Where not. Here we go. Sea lions. Sea lions, very good. Fish. Not really sea lions, but fur seals. Yep. Very much closely related. Krill. Snow and ice. Fish. Thank you. And Pateraso. Krill. Orca. Orca. Very good. Leopard seals. Leopard seals are Skuas. amazing. Skua. Oh, yay. Gross. Gross? No, they're amazing. No, they're dinosaurs that are gross. Permafrost? Very much so. Whales. Yeah. Really sunny in summer? Yes. Good. Eternal winter? Pretty much. That's what it feels like. Okay. Good. Sunlight? Very good. I love it. Krill? Good. Ice? Snow? Oh my goodness. There's. I wish I could do a course in Antarctic biology and, and geography because there's so much to tell you. Um, but, uh, I think, I think the library has my book. So if you want to look at it, you totally can. Um, but, uh, but yeah, there's so much cool stuff going on, uh, in Antarctica. I, it is a desert and it is this incredible oasis for supporting life, um, which is strange, but life is supported not so much in the terrestrial environment, very much so in the marine environment. It is one of the mo the richest places in terms of biomass of life on the planet because cold water, this is counterintuitive, cold water is amazing uh, for supporting life because it can hold more dissolved oxygen than warm water can. So cold water is a good thing and uh, the penguins know about it. Uh, elephant seals with big, huge noses. Okay, so let's start to uh, reveal some of the elements that we've got here. It was kind of hard in terms of getting screenshots of these elements from the actual Happy Feet uh, movie. So like you'll have to kind of like, you know, imagine that, that the penguin up here is penguins, but also sunlight. Um, we have Will and Bill Krill. We have orcas. Uh, we have the leopard seal. Uh, we have skuas. Boo. No, we have elephant seals with their big noses. Uh, we have humpback whales jellyfish and fish. Let's kind of just lump them together if oh, that's okay. That's I know, so... it hurts, it hurts. Oh. Smith is dying. Um, uh, snow and ice and water. And here, if you don't mind, again, a little sort of like extending your creativity, let's, let's recognize the phytoplankton and the algae that is in this big massive piece of ice. Okay, um, and so right now we've got pretty much most of the ecosystem captured within happy feet. So what I would love for you to do, it will be madness and that is okay, is start connecting the dots. Let's build an ecosystem web, okay? So in order to do that, what you need to do is you need to go, okay, which one do I wanna start out with? Let's start out with Will and Bill Krill because they're awesome. So who eats Will and Bill Krill? What does Will and Bill Krill eat? Where do they live? Just make connections to all of these questions. And then uh, actually let's just stick with Will and Bill Krill. So let's make connections for Will and Bill Krill to all the things that are relevant. Super good. <clears throat> Amazing. And, uh, and let's screenshot like the different and then we can, because it'll just be madness. Okay, super good. What if I told you that, believe it or not, the primary diet, compo like prey item of a leopard seal is krill. So let's make sure we get the leopard seal connection to there we go. Thank you. Super good. Okay, pretty much connected to all of the things. This is an important species within the ecosystem. Can I interject with a thought and yes. something to reflect upon? Please. That in the nodes that we're talking about, so I'll add some words, so the nodes are the pictures of this food web. Very frequently, the krill, the these invertebrate nodes are more than species. They're often multiple phyla looped oh, together. Oh, that's good. So this is a box that contains unknown numbers of species. Seven, actually, in well, Antarctica. <laughs> so so in, in Antarctica, yeah. Yeah, because it's simple. But if you unpack a box that says zooplankton, yeah. but even then, so it's seven. So seven. it's there's it's it's yes. more nodes within that box than there are 
um, pinniped nodes. And I think actually the species name of the like endemic krill is I, it, is it superba? Like it is superb. It yeah, they're massive um, and beautiful. Um, okay, cool. And I I I went to this volcano in Antarctica, like that like comes out of the ocean so the beaches are warm and it cooks the krill on the side of the beaches like anyway antarctica is just wild okay cool so let's do another one if you don't mind uh and then we do have to kind of like snap it up so let's connect um uh somebody really let's connect uh penguins penguins to all the things that are connected to penguins Yay. Yeah. That's it. Wonderful. So the point is things are intricately connected, right? And I and and when things happen to one species or to one node that represents multiple species, things have to change, right? Things have to shift. Um, and it's not necessarily that there's going to be this massive collapse. It all depends on the context, on what's going on. And so what we want to tell you is a couple of stories of things that have gone on. There's surprise among yeah. some of the, uh, some of our friends that there are volcanoes in Antarctica. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Black sand. Black sand. So cool. Actually, this photo was taken on the beaches, the black sand beaches of the volcano that I'm talking about. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So here's generally what's going on with happy feet. Um, and this is an actual Antarctic food web. So it's pretty simple. Simplicity is delightful for understanding relationships and connections. And so one of the reasons why there are polar biologists um, is because they represent simple systems that we can more easily wrap our little brains around in order to understand because there are places in the world where that simplicity doesn't exist. We're going to skip this. You can do it on your own time. But this is um, a reminder to talk about the fact that the simplicity sometimes masks things. So if you're looking at all of these balls and this kind of tinker toy, which was a thing that I got to play with growing up. All of these nodes here are different species eating one species in the very bottom of plant. Lots of things eating the plant, lots of things then eating the things that eat the plant, and then some things that are even eating the things that eat the things that eat the plant. And this is how we, this was the simple on the top, simple way we originally thought about it until we unmasked using some genetics who was actually eating whom. And this is what it then becomes. Wow. And our understanding of who is eating whom in these food webs can be really, in, even in simple systems, this is, a, this is not a tropical model, this is a temperate model from around here. And so understanding and unpacking who's within those nodes can really change your understanding of where energy is moving inside of a system. And one last example of that is here, which is where some people unpacked a box which was so uh, just look at the names here on the left hand side okay this is zooplankton which you're oh. gonna see in a in a box in a second so this is not just multiple families or multiple species this is multiple phyla so as you can imagine remember kingdom phylum class order family genus species uh -huh. so I think it starts with domain now uh, I think well, I think the young ones it, have added it, a <laughs> since it doesn't matter it doesn't really matter. evolutionarily it doesn't matter where you want to start it arbitrarily yeah. but if you don't understand if you don't understand even at a gross level at the phyla of annelids or mollusks or or copepods or 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 yeah. dinoflagellates it's very hard to understand. So the simplicity is intriguing and attractive to us as biologists, but it always has to be used understanding that that elegance can be a compromise and the compromise might be in its accuracy. Are you making a pitch for invertebrate morphology and evolution? Uh, if you want to understand how the world works. Zoology 2700, take it, super fun. Okay, so let us tell you a story. And take, like, just like slow clap, do a Nancy Pelosi. Why? Because that food web is gorgeous and predates <laughs> being able to plot them. This, this is done by hand. By hand. That's, Somebody that's drew a, That this. is a classic drawing yeah. for a really economically important species in the North Atlantic. That's right. Oh my goodness. Okay, so cod. It used to be a thing. 
We used to have a lot of them. Uh, in fact, they have played a really important part of European colonial history. Because um, they're delicious. Because they're delicious. And yeah. huge. And maybe if we didn't have, well, we would have figured out some other reason to colonize and take over. So whatever. But it was one of the driving reasons in terms of resources. Right? Oh, my God. Okay. So um, cod, really important and less important in Canada today, but still very important to some people um, in Canada. So let's tell you the story about cod because it happened in the 80s, way back when rotary phones were a thing. Um, so here on the left hand side is the cod food web, the cod ecosystem. And cod, you can see, is right here in the middle. And it's one of those ones just like you did with Will and Bill Krill that is connected connected to like all of the things and we'll tell you why in a bit with your homework okay there were lots of cod uh, on the on the coast of, uh, of on the east coast of Canada specifically in the Grand Banks um, off of Newfoundland uh, and Labrador so uh, <laughs> thank you for the hat it's very distinguished Okay, um, and it really was a driver of the economy of, of Newfoundland and Labrador. Um, cod fishing was important. It was deeply embedded within families. Uh, it contributed to individual and family identity. Uh, their boats were their chariots. It was, it was a really important part of uh, the Canadian economy as well. Um, and. Uh, all of these things being intricately connected. Uh, we had a Department of Fisheries and Oceans that was studying the cod stocks. Um, and, <coughs> um, it, was, it was just a really important part of the economy. And then one day it was less important um, in the economy and there were all sorts of conflicts that happened. So first of all, the environmental conflict uh, the ecosystem conflict was this massive drop uh, in fishing and therefore massive drop in available fish um, that came, uh, started to come in the 70s and then uh, in uh, the 90s and then finally down in, by 1995, there was just a, a huge collapse of the cod fishery. Remember the other day some of you were asking about humans getting out of carrying capacity control with technological advance? Yeah. This is some of that. This is changing with technology where and how efficiently we're, we were fishing. And I point that out just to say that the story that happened was the same. That yeah. it was a temporary, yeah. oh, things are good. Oh. Yeah. We can, we can fish lower down in the ocean now. Or we can fish things. farther out yeah. now. Um, you know, maybe this was refrigeration that happened that allowed fishers to go out further, you know, offshore or whatever. And then, of course, it didn't last very long. The tension is important uh, because depending on who you talk to, uh, there are different people responsible. So scientists were responsible, fishers were responsible, managers were responsible. All of these things back and forth created an incredibly hard and difficult conflict. People lost their jobs. Families were food insecure. It was it was absolutely terrible. Uh, mental health just uh, like an epidemic uh, throughout um, these fishing communities, right? Because people had to be retrained, and all of a sudden, these government people were coming in, going, "We'll teach you to use the computer, right? And here's like a Commodore 64, and we'll show you how to program." And like people were like, "No, my boat. I want to be outside. This is my livelihood." So it was awful. Um, okay, so. Oh, wow. Two stories. There's a person in class Brian Tobin. who is a relative of Brian Tobin. Amazing. Okay. Good. Okay. So two stories were in the news, right? The politics got in, in the way of things. And this was the myth that was being sold to people. The myth was um, that the seals were eating all of the fish before the fishers could get them. And the seal population was increasing. So, you know, people were like, oh, we got to go kill all the seals. So then they launched this massive gray seal cull, right, to reduce the numbers of seals um, that apparently would increase the number of fish. And of course, this did not work because the food web, the ecosystem was not fully appreciated or explored. Okay, what actually happened was this. The reality was that we were taking too many fish, that we weren't managing, we weren't sort of, and like fishers knew this too, it's not 
any blame necessarily on them, right? Our whole system was set up to take more than what was sustainable for the, for the ecosystem population. And the reason why the seals were doing pretty darn well was because they already adapted. They already started eating smaller fish, right? It reduced the competition among the gray seals by focusing on smaller fish, different species, pollock and capelin and things like this, such that their population was able to grow. Their carrying capacity increased because they weren't focused on cod, which was diminishing in terms of availability. So within an ecosystem, you can change your niche, right? Over time through evolutionary processes. You can also change your diet within an individual's lifetime uh, in order to reduce competition. So this is what happened but we managed it in a very different way because we're, we're pretty bad at managing things responsibly for the most part. Um, but we allow conflict and we allow sort of these myths to get in the way of like proper evidence-based informed decisions. So we gave you this like just totally bananas kind of food web with all of these things. We don't expect you to be able to tease out all of them. So let's simplify the food web for the grand banks. And even in its simplicity, and this is where we come back to this idea of why it is so connected, why cod is so connected. It's because really one cod, so Smith was talking about like um, zooplankton being like 20,000 species and all of us, and, and that's not fair to represent 20,000 species of zooplankton in one box when we've got herring in another box, right? Like these are not like the same. But anyway, another problem is that throughout an individual's lifetime, they can play a different role in the ecosystem, right? Of course, right? So mussels have veliger larvae. Larvae are eaten by different things or they eat different things than the adults do. And the same thing goes with cod. So the larval cod, the juvenile cod, and the adult cod all occupy different niches, realized niches, and fundamental niches within the ecosystem, okay? So it's still complex, even though we're simplifying. And our homework for you <laughs> is this kind of kind of approach, this kind of question. So based on this simplified food web, what could happen if 25 years after the collapse of the cod, we released millions of adult, juvenile, or larval cod into the Atlantic? So kind of play around with those three scenarios. So imagine we released adult cod, imagine we released juvenile cod, imagine that we released larval cod. What might happen or not happen? just kind of come up with a whole bunch of plausible scenarios that could work based on the relationships that you see here, right? This is a super important exercise. Managers do it, fisheries, and managers ought to do it, have to do it, fishers, um, ecologists have to do it, yeah. species have to do it. I mean, you think one of the reasons that insects are a successful taxon on the planet is because their different life stages occupy radically different niches. And so if we are trying to model for the successful harvest of a particular species and we don't incorporate our understanding of how throughout an individual's life they feed on different things or are fed upon by different predators, we're just, we're kind of running around in the library just bashing books off the shelf. We're not actually reading the books. Yeah, good, okay. I love this Super exercise. Good. Yay. Okay. Wonderful. And with that, we will thank you yeah. for your enthusiasm and participation once again. Um, and uh, have a wonderful weekend. Yes. Which is coming uh, up in a few days. Make sure that you um, trick or treat well. Yes. Be responsibly. Safe. Wear yes. a mask. A mask. And a mask. And a mask. Yeah. <laughs> Take care, everyone. And we wave. wave. And we wave. Say hello. Bye-bye. Have fun storming the castle. Are you going to make it? <laughs> Not a chance. <laughs>